Hello students, this is Professor Gore and in this recorded lecture we're going to be talking about the home front uh, for World War II. So this is really tremendously important because this is what a lot of times you'll see uh, the home front stuff on tests and quizzes and so forth. You, some military, um, and I love teaching on the military stuff, but typically what you would see um, a lot on tests is like the home front stuff. Um, same thing with the AP US history exam as well. So. One thing is just like World War I, but at a, for a much longer time because uh, World War II lasted longer for the United States, is you see um, tons of propaganda posters. And, and I've, I've included a bunch here so you can kind of see them um, and so forth. Nazis destroying churches and Nazis are going to uh, threaten your family and so forth to get Americans to support the war effort, either joining up for the military forces, uh, willing to ration at home, willing to make sacrifices for the war effort, willing to go uh, get jobs in the war industries and so forth. Uh, the Nazis are going to destroy the Bible um, and so forth. Safe freedom of speech by war bonds. This is trying to get people to finance the war, war production, um, buy extra bonds and so forth. So just like World War I, one of the ways that they're going to pay for the war is the selling of war bonds and actually even more War bonds were sold in World War II far more than World War I because the war also lasted long. You're looking at 1917 to 1918 and World War I. You're looking at the end of 1941 until August of 1945. Uh, this one's saying that the Soviets are your friend. Well, we didn't think that 10 years before. Uh, and then also the British soldier as well. Um, I gave a man, will you at least give 10% of your, of your pay in war bonds, trying to motivate people. Uh, this right here on the right is trying to get people to grow their own gardens at home so they're not buying uh, produce at the grocery store. So more of that produce can be sent to the war effort to feed uh, the American armies and other armies that they're, they're providing food for. Um, just like you saw the same thing in World War I. Really, in a lot of ways, the home front in terms of rationing and sacrificing and the government taking over industries is identical from World War I to World War II. World War II, we just do it better because it lasts longer. Um, and this on the left is referring to Pearl Harbor, the one on the right, which you've seen in the previous lecture about Pearl Harbor. This is one about the Bataan Death March. Okay, Avenge Pearl Harbor. These colors won't run. Avenge Pearl Harbor. Um, it was very difficult. Uh, in fact, you typically did not get any, any new set of tires during the entire war. Uh, the federal government implements a nationwide speed limit of 55 miles an hour, so that way it would reduce gas. Um, you could only buy so much gas each month. Um, it was very difficult to get a new, a new pair of shoes during the war because so much of leather and uh, the materials go into making shoes were, were used uh, in the war effort. Um, women, just like in World War I, but except even more so, six million women worked outside the home and, um, during World War II never had before, particularly in the defense industries. Um, this one is uh, somebody who's a secretary usually would type up letters um, about um, uh, somebody had passed away or was, was injured in combat. Um, also trying to get people, if you worked in the fence industries, not talk. This was saying that this guy's drowning because somebody talked. Um, talking about bombing Japan, join the Navy, America's answer production. Well, we actually outproduced the Germans, Italians, and Japanese combined. Uh, nobody produced as much uh, war material as the United States. It is incredible what the U.S. does during World War II. Conserve material. My favorite all time, I used to have this poster up in my classroom, loose lips might sink ships. Now, so how are you going to finance the war? Well, um, the GDP before the war was about $99.7 billion. By the end of war, it was $901, uh, I'm sorry, $211 billion. Uh, American business profits doubled during the war because of what the amount of money with deficit spending goes in to finance the war, plus the selling of war bonds. Um, so raise taxes just like World War I and borrow money through the selling war bonds. Okay. Um, so selling war bonds, deficit spending, did both those things in World War I. Uh, the Revenue Act of 1942 increased taxes. So now our debt, uh, this is pale in comparison today, which is over 20 something trillion by the time um, at the time I'm making this lecture, but it was only a two, 258.6 billion in 1945. Um, you know, the number of people that were employed by the federal government increased four times uh, because of how much the government expands during the war, just like in World War I. Um, so the War Production Board, their job is to go from making refrigerators to go to making bombs, go to making uh, Chevys and Fords to go making Jeeps and trucks and tanks. 
um, and so forth. And what happens is, is the War Production Board awards defense contracts to you know General Motors, to Ford, to Chrysler. Um, and, and so they took over these factories and turned them into making stuff for the war effort. Um, and what, what ends up happening is, is they, they promise the, the business owner a profit, which they grant, which they do. They're able to pay their workers uh, better than they ever have before. Uh, and it produces great quality war production goods during the war. We produce some incredible products during the war. And so because really because the American public was really motivated for the war, um, I can't understate that how 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 motivated uh, and united the country was one of the most united times in American history. Um, they also evaluated resources like uh, um, how much um, uh, natural resources we have. And, and the cost plus system is what guaranteed the, the owners of the factories are going to make a profit. Uh, Henry Kaiser um, also introduced um, the moving assembly line production that Henry Ford had, had uh, modeled in the early part of the 1900s. Now he does it for shipbuilding. Um, now, these aren't the massive battleships, but they were able to produce an average size ship about every 14 days. That is incredible that they could do. And a lot of women worked on those uh, shipyards as well. So during the war, this is all estimated. About 86,000 tanks were produced by the United States. Now, Sherman tanks weren't near as good as the German tanks or even some of the Soviet tanks. In fact, it sometimes took three to five Sherman tanks to take out one Panzer or German Tiger tank. But nonetheless, uh, we produced a lot of them. Um, also, 296,000 airplanes were produced um, during the war. No wonder we can bomb Germany, Italy, and Japan into oblivion. Uh, 15 million rifles and machine guns. 64,000 landing craft, 6,500 cargo ships and naval vessels. In fact, we had such a surplus of bullets, we kept uh, one of, some of the same rifles in the Korean War just to use up all the ammo. Okay, What's crazy is how many people served. 15 million men and women served during World War II. Not all of them saw combat. 700,000 African-Americans served. So just like you see minorities serving in World War I, you had African-Americans, Hispanics, Native Americans. Asians also served uh, in large numbers. Uh, women served in different capacities in the war. There were non-combat roles, uh, but a lot of them were uh, flight nurses or um, nurses for men in combat. They did various roles, uh, maybe driving uh, ambulance uh, vehicles and so forth. Um, thousand WASP, Women's Air Force Service pilots and so forth, um, were, were mobilized at this time. And it really is incredible. Um, and, and there were, I mean, there, Initially, when the war broke out, you had lines wrapped around buildings for the recruitment stations. Now, we did have to implement a draft in 1940, and a lot of men were drafted. Uh, and I don't want to say that everybody that, that joined was, was a volunteer because a lot of them were drafted. But it really bothered American men if they couldn't serve. Many of them, some, some took their own life when they were rejected. My grandfather, who played nine years in the NFL, my mom's dad, uh, my mom said he never once spoke about the war because – he tried to join the Army, the Navy, and the Marines and was rejected by all three because he had a heart murmur. He had a irregular heartbeat that it didn't keep him to live until he was 84. But uh, he was ashamed that he couldn't serve. And uh, he, he didn't speak about the war because um, he was he was ashamed of not being able to do his part, even though he was married with kids. Okay? Um, so you had diversity in the armed forces and so forth. Um, you still have segregated units um, for African-Americans in World War II. Great tragedy in, in our history. That's going to end with uh, Harry S. Truman's executive order uh, in 1948 to uh, end that. And then the Korean War is the first uh, conflict where you have uh, uh, integrated units. Um, Native Americans play a very, very important role. Um, we, the United States took advantage of two different tribes, one for, for the Pacific Theater, one for the European Theater. And a lot of these men uh, have been decorated uh, either uh, during the war or posthumously, which means after they died. Um, but the Navajo tribe, which was a, uh, the Navajo language, was one that had not been um, uh, ever written down. And so in the Pacific Theater, uh, the United States recruited Navajo um, Native Americans to to serve as uh, radio cold talkers so they could call over different uh, things over the radio. And um, the Japanese were not able to decipher it. In fact, each of these guys had an uh, American, another different American uh, soldier attached to them. And if they were about to be captured by the Japanese, they were going to be they were ordered to kill them because the Japanese would have tortured them and then broke the code. The Comanche tribe was utilized in Europe. So a lot of people have heard of the, the code talkers for the Navajo because of the movie Wind Talkers with Nicolas Cage. But the, the Comanche played an important role 
in the European theater uh, doing that uh, as well. So they've kind of forgotten. Um, you saw um, pictures like this with Rosie the Riveter, um, who played an important role. Now, one thing I did forget to mention is that um, a lot of African-Americans serve in combat in the Italian theater, which is kind of forgotten theater of World War II. In fact, the, the unit that had the greatest casualty rate in the war was actually a Texas unit at the Battle of Monte Cassino. But um, a lot of men fought very bravely in kind of forgotten theater of, uh, of Italy. But Rosa River kind of motivated women. If you ever go to, well, if you go to, um, to a main university one day, it seems like every sword in America has used this as an emblem on the back of a, a sorority t-shirt at one point. Um, here are women making uh, wings for planes. Okay, this is uh, making ship rudders. Look at all those bombers. Um, so six to seven million new jobs created during the war um, by women. A lot of African-Americans. You have the second great migration in American history taking place where African-Americans moved in large numbers from the south to the north or the western uh, cities to provide jobs, provide jobs in the war industries, and it really elevated their status quite a bit. A lot of African-Americans under the middle class as a result. Um, so women made up a larger percent of the workforce. And one thing that begins established, um, and it's going to continue after the war, is the establishment of daycares so that uh, uh, working moms can um, have a job as well. And, and you see this especially play out in the 1960s, particularly in the 70s and 80s. Um, the National War Labor Board, similar to the War Production Board, they're the ones going to determine wages hours and working conditions. They wanted workers that were happy, well-paid, good, safe working conditions. Happy workers make happy, uh, good, uh, um, stable products. And um, in any plant that went on strike, it was illegal to go on strike uh, during the war. Um, the War Labor Board could take over the factory and operate it. And that did happen. So incomes rose as much as 70% during the war. Um, and then John L. Lewis, who was a, a labor organizer, he ended up leading the United Mine Workers out on the strike, demanding higher wages in, in, in mining. And the War Labor Board was like, no, you're not going to do that. Um, and he does win. But what ends up happening is the, the labor movement kind of peaks in the early 1950s. And then after that, the labor movement is going to be on a steady decline. In fact, still today, labor unions are um, smaller than they have been in previous decades. Now, um, after John O. Lewis won the strike, uh, the smith Conley Labor Act made it where it was illegal to strike in a defense industry uh, and so forth. Now, what ends up happening is A. Philip Randolph, who, who led um, one of the earliest African-American units uh, for um, uh, car porters and so forth for railroad companies, um, he called for a march on Washington because African-Americans were being discriminated against and getting hired in the defense industries. FDR uh, issued an executive order that basically made it where um, you could not be discriminated against in the war industries on you know, race, creed, color, national origin. And so it allowed African-Americans to get a lot of jobs in, in defense industries. And to make sure that was enforced, um, he created a government agency during the war called the Fair Employment Practices Commission. So just to make sure people are getting treated fairly in the workplace and hiring and firing and so forth. Also, CORE, which is going to be well known um, when we get to the Civil Rights Movement because they're the ones that organize the Freedom Rides. It's a civil rights organization. It actually was founded during World War II to make sure African-Americans were treated fairly in the defense industries and later become uh, tremendously famous in American history for the Freedom Riders. In fact, you have to watch a uh, your second film assignment uh, for my U.S. History II class on the Freedom Riders and usually students really enjoy that one. Here's a Philip Randolph. He actually spoke um, at uh, a later march on Washington in the 60s. Now, Mexican-American workers also um, were able to find better jobs as well, but there was also um, some prejudice and discrimination that took place there. Um, one of the things that is founded during World War II is what's called LULAC. LULAC is basically the NAACP for Mexican Americans. Okay, so it's a legal organization that challenges discrimination, much like the NAACP does. Particularly, the NAACP during the civil rights movements argued and challenged in the Brown versus Board of Education. LULAC did that for cases relating to Mexican Americans. Um, they protested in Texas because of limited job opportunities and segregation because there was segregation um, for Hispanics down in the south uh, west part uh, and the southern part of Texas. Uh, one thing, though, because so many farmers either get drafted or join the, the armed forces during the war, there is a shortage of farmers. Uh, my dad's father, uh, which was older when World War II uh, took place, he was in his uh, early 40s. Uh, I'm sorry, he was in his uh, mid-30s, mid I'm sorry. He was a farmer and um, 
he didn't get drafted because he, he owned a farm in Southeast Arkansas. And so they, they paid him to, to farm for the, for the war effort. And one of the things that the United States implements is what's called the Brasiero program, which is a deal we worked out with the Mexican government to, for them to send over Mexican workers to work in our farm fields and so forth. Um, now, New Deal, a lot of the programs into the reform program stay, you know, such like Social Security and the FHA and SEC and the FDIC and so forth. But a lot of it uh, ended. One thing, though, the United States does pass in Congress uh, in 1944 is arguably one of the greatest things the United States ever passed uh, on be, really in our country and really for veterans. It's called the um, GI Bill is what we typically call it. And uh, what it does, the Congress is trying to figure out a way, how do we ward these servicemen for their time, giving up some of the best years of their life in service of our country. And so they reward them with education, job training, medical care, and pensions, as well as mortgage loans. So for instance, um, if you had served a certain amount of time, you could uh, attend college for free, or you could, in fact, most veterans actually took advantage of trade school. We forget how the, the GI Bill can also pay for trade school if you wanna be a welder, an electrician, or something like that. Um, you also establish VA hospitals, Veterans Affairs hospitals that were established after World War I that continues. Also getting a, a pension for their time and service, depending on how long they had been in. And then one of the things that takes place and still around today is that uh, veterans can take advantage of low interest mortgage loans. Um, and one of the things that, that they can also get is um, they can uh, either put little to nothing down. Um, at one, one point, one of the house, uh, one of our houses, my wife and I were looking to sell. We had a potential VA loan um, that was offered in our house, and they were going to put very little down, but they were going to get a really low interest rate, and so forth. Um, but that that's still around for veterans today. I have a uh, my mentor when I first started teaching took advantage of the GI Bill to go to undergrad at U University of North Texas. And then had a little bit of money left over um, because Texas has another bill that, that helps veterans. He was able to go to get his master's at UTD for free. Uh, and then uh, he and his wife were able to take care, uh, take advantage of a VA loan. So really cool thing, really cool program that uh, the government does for uh, veterans. And really we'll see the effects of this after the war. When we get to uh, the 19, late 1940s and, and 50s where a lot of uh, home ownership is going to be on the rise. Now, FDR decides to run for a fourth term um, because the war was still going on. If the war had already ended, he probably wouldn't have. Um, he runs against Thomas Dewey, um, who was a governor. And um, the big debate is who is going to be um, his vice president. It actually becomes Harry Truman, who who is going to become a president when FDR dies of brain aneurysm. So what was life like on the home front? Well, Americans rationed. Um, they grew vegetables and produce and stuff in their backyards to conserve for the war, war effort. They had meatless Mondays where you couldn't buy meat on Mondays or wheatless Wednesdays where you wouldn't buy bread and stuff on Wednesdays. Anything that would normally be shipped to the grocery store on those days goes to the war effort. Um, and what's crazy is 40% of the nation's vegetables are grown this way. That's cool that Americans did that. Um, just like the crew organization did propaganda during World War I, the Office of War Information did that for World War II. Um, the, the press was, um, um, censored. And how most people found um, out what was going on with Warford is they would watch newsreels before they watched movies uh, at the movie theaters. In fact, um, um, it was extremely popular to go watch movies during World War II, as a lot of Americans did, because you had higher income levels that could afford to go to the movies much more than previous. And so you see a lot of propaganda posters established by the Office of War Information, similar to the Creole organization, World War I. And um, it always portrayed, with particular these newsreels, that the war was always going well. Um, and you never even, you know, there was a, you would get in the newspapers that we lost some conflicts, but um, usually it would always like try to uh, butter it up a little bit, make it sound better. Uh, the office of price administration kept prices at a certain level. Um, and, um, um, and so forth. Now this is a nationwide speed limit of 35 It's actually 55. And then in some areas it's lower to 35. It just depends on where you were. And so, um, it was a nationwide speed limit of 55, but, um, Anyway, they, the, the government rationed and regulated nearly everything. And so, you know, uh, entertainment stuff was a little bit easier to get, but every, everyday stuff you really had to do without. And Americans did it willingly because they wanted to win the war. Um, recycling was big. You could even recycle uh, bacon grease to be used as fuel. 
uh, and so forth. Now, we talked about the Great Migration. You can see how many people are leaving the South, about 1.2 million African-Americans moving up to various parts, particularly the Midwest, like Chicago, Cleveland, Detroit, Milwaukee, um, Cincinnati, those kind of those kind of cities. Now, with um, so many Mexican Americans that were coming, uh, many of them um, found jobs in Southern California with the defense industries, and they began living in ethnic neighborhoods, much like previous immigrants had done for decades in American history. Um, and some of these these neighborhoods were impoverished, but as Ameri Mexican Americans began gaining more and more money, they spent them on nice clothing. Now. One of the things we don't, we can't uh, picture today, but zoot suits were a very popular um, clothing item back then. We don't see that today. I don't know if they were going to come back in style or not, but uh, long jackets, baggy. If you've ever seen um, the mask with um, Jim Carrey, that's kind of a zoot suit and so forth. But what ends up happening in 1943, uh, naval servicemen on leave um, actually attacked uh, many of these Mexican-Americans uh, due to racism and prejudice. Uh, strip them of their suits like this, and some were beaten and, and humiliated. Um, soldiers are reprimanded, and what ends up happening is uh, the United States Navy bans um, naval soldiers from going on leave in LA to prevent future conflicts. And so there's actually a movie, or not, uh, well, there's a, a song called Zoot Suit Riot. Um, you want to put a star by this one because this is something to remember. Now, uh, one of the probably the most infamous thing of the war. Um, for the United States action, that and deciding not to bomb the rail lines going to the concentration camps is Executive Order 9066. Now you can you can argue that the United States didn't fully understand what was happening with uh, the internment camps. Plus, they were trying to bomb military sites to hurry up and win the war. But Executive Order 9066 is something the federal government actually has come out and apologized in the 1980s for, and um, gave issued a, a twenty thousand dollar check to any survivor or the descendant um, who was interned in these internment camps. So what ends up happening is after Pearl Harbor, it was thought that um, a lot of Japanese Americans that lived in Hawaii had given information to um, the Japanese military because they knew how to hit us so well. And it was thought in early, late 1941, early 1942, that, that Japan was probably going to invade the West Coast. And they thought that we, we were not military prepared and would we couldn't stop until they got to Chicago or something. Uh, and so there's a ton of, Jap or not ton, but there's 110,000 Japanese Americans that live on the West Coast. And this is where it affects. And um, F FDR issued an executive order that uh, uh, routed them up and put them into 10 different internment camps across the country. Now, is it like concentration camps? No. Basically what it is is they stayed in these makeshift barracks uh, and just stayed there. Um, they could play and so forth within the compound, but they couldn't really go anywhere. Um, they were released after the war. Um, a lot of their businesses and, and homes and so forth were damaged. Um, men um, um, who were military age could get out if they took a loyalty oath to the Union and uh, join the armed forces. Most of the Japanese American men who served served in the European theater so they wouldn't be confused with the Japanese enemy. Um, and what's crazy is of all the infantry units, the most decorated infantry unit of the war in the European theater was actually the Japanese American unit. So hats off to those young men with their families interned and they, they fought their butts off uh, in the European theater. Others that were used in the Pacific were who could speak Japanese fluent were used to interrogate prisoners and, and, and try to intercept radio communication and so forth. And there was two actually, Rower and Jerome, they were actually in Arkansas randomly. See, this is Manzanar, uh, one in the California desert. I would not have wanted to go there. This is being them being rounded up on to trains. That's crazy. Definitely not a shining moment in American history. Now, um, not everybody was going to, to agree with this. And so a Japanese American by the name of Kori Matsu challenged this in the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court actually ruled in the United States government's favor. Um, but later, the United States government admitted fall in the 1980s. All right. We will come back to the war in Europe and then the war in Asia uh, in two more parts.